Mm. I have you loud and clear. <laughs> Hello. 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 Welcome. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Science. And that is to say, physics, medicine, nature, or space, time, the brain, life, the universe. Hello, welcome to The Naked Scientist, the show where we bring you the latest breakthroughs in science, technology and medicine with me, Phil Sansom and Chris Smith. And this week, to lighten the lockdown for you, we're taking you on a voyage of discovery using only the view from your window. From cloud spotting to bird watching and stargazing, you're never going to look upon the sky the same way again. Plus, news of how the world's poorest countries are bracing against the next wave of coronavirus and why we all need to help them. And scientists discover a new drug that could block the virus from getting into our cells. The Naked Scientists podcast is powered by UKfast.co.uk. First up, as the world passes 2 million confirmed coronavirus cases, we're taking a look at how its poorer regions are dealing with the pandemic. So far, it's mostly been richer countries where huge outbreaks have happened, with a lag in the numbers in India and Africa in particular. But if poorer countries do get hit, they're going to be hit much harder, which is why, to many, it's a great injustice when it's largely well-off air travellers that appear to have been spreading the disease in the first place. And a pandemic isn't a problem any country can solve on its own. After all, eliminating the coronavirus in your own home doesn't do much good if it can easily return from your infected neighbours. So the World Health Organization has been coordinating the international effort, despite criticism over its initial handling and threats from President Trump to pull American funding. Soumya Swaminathan is the World Health Organization's chief scientist. She spoke to me about this global balancing act. We've been working particularly with those countries with weaker health systems. And our teams have gone into many different countries now to work with the national governments in developing strategies. So 80% of countries now have a national strategic response plan for COVID-19. How do these strategies vary country by country? It depends a lot on the state of the health system and the resources that are available. And in fact, after the Ebola outbreak, WHO actually went out and and said very clearly that an unknown pathogen could really threaten the world. And the only way to deal with that is to really have good surveillance systems, good primary healthcare systems. And of course, now we realize that in many countries, this is not the case. And what we're seeing, I think, is very telling because what we're seeing is a devastation that's happening in the high income countries in countries where we think health systems are very robust. And we see the intensive care units and the hospitals being overrun by patients and healthcare workers just unable to cope. Is that a case of where the pandemic actually is? Or is that a case of there's more testing in the higher income countries? The testing for this virus is a molecular test. It's what we call a PCR test. You need a PCR lab. Many countries in Africa do not have it. And that was a reason for the late picking up of cases. But I think that's not the only reason. The epidemic is maturing at different times in different parts of the world. And you see the wave from Southeast Asia, then in Europe, now North America, potentially Africa, the Middle East, South Asia. In one of these lower income countries, can you give me an example of what one of your strategies might involve? One is, of course, to get people to build up the capacity to do the testing. And so we've sent out more than a million and a half diagnostic kits to many of these countries. We had training uh, lab technicians and labs in every country in Africa, for example. Then it was building up the national response plan, making sure that hospitals have enough equipments like oxygen, personal protective equipments, training of healthcare workers, and, and then community information and education of the communities because In many ways, this is asking people to change their behavior. You're being asked to stay at home, cut all your social activities and connections. And of course, again, in the low-income countries, we, we have to deal with situations where people have to go to work to earn a living and to eat. We're still grappling with what is the right approach, what's the right balance. On the one hand, you you need physical distancing and avoiding people getting together in one place in order to cut transmission. On the other hand, there's the economic need and the human need to make sure that people are not starving and they're not suffering. What about this scientific research into dealing with the coronavirus? What have you done so far? We developed 
a multi-country large randomized trial called the Solidarity Trial to look at potential drugs that could have activity against this virus. And currently we have over 80 countries that will be enrolling patients. The first drug is Remdesivir, antiviral drug that was tested against Ebola, was not found to be effective, but this is also an RNA virus. So we're testing it against this. Chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine, which of course are old drugs and used other than malaria for other diseases. A drug called lopinavir and ritonavir. It's a combination, anti-HIV drugs. And the fourth is a combination of lopinavir, ritonavir with interferon beta-1, which is an immune stimulant. Within a couple of months, I hope that we will have results. If any of these drugs that you're testing do end up really working, what's the plan then, especially with regard to some of the poorer countries that we were talking about? That's a really good question. And I think that's something that WHO always has right upfront equitable access to people all over the world, regardless of whether they're able to pay or not. We have organizations like Global Alliance for Vaccines, which distributes vaccines in 73 countries, mostly low-income countries. We also then have to think about middle-income countries, where most of the world's poor actually live today. And then, of course, the high-income countries also certainly need the vaccine. So it's a question of what could be a formula or or principles to decide this. For example, if we had the first few tens of millions of doses of a vaccine, who would we prioritize? Would it be healthcare workers around the world, healthcare workers plus the elderly? I mean, we may have to face some of these questions. Salmiya Swaminathan, the World Health Organization's chief scientist. Now, a large chunk of those who need the most help with their health care live in the world's second most populous country, and that is India. And while India has had fewer than 10,000 cases of coronavirus so far, they've nevertheless gone into lockdown alongside many other African nations. And this is to preemptively stop the coronavirus wreaking havoc across the nation. Lalit Kant is an epidemiologist who's advising the Public Health Foundation of India, and he gave Phil an idea of the current consequences. India is going through a difficult time. We are entering into a period where the government had instituted a strong lockdown. Trains were stopped, the buses were stopped, the aeroplanes were stopped, the borders were all sealed. 17% of cases come from one single state. Also from that state come around 41% of total deaths, Maharashtra. But there are states in India which have a slow growth rate. Here in the UK, the government's actions have been based, you know, for better or worse, on these modelling studies. Has the Indian government been following something similar? Well, there have been advice given to the government of India by different modelling groups. And uh, they paint a very stark picture, you know, and... uh, At the peak, might be 100 million people infected. 10 million are expected to be, you know, bad. And then there is another scenario that, you know, between 15th of May and 30th of May, we will get about 1 million cases, 30,000 deaths. All the mathematical models are as good as the input that you have to put into it. But at least we have some indication to go by. Those are some staggeringly high potential numbers, though. So India has its own problems, you know, population is big, density of population is high. We have a huge slum population. 20% of our population may be below the poverty line. We have a public health system which is not very effective. We have a poor surveillance system. People have a lot of blood pressure, cardiovascular diseases, diabetes. Great challenges that we need to address. Are there any plans for how to address those right now? The government is taking the battle to the where the enemy is, hand-to-hand combat. And India's fight could make or break the global war. We have a good capacity to test, but the government of India has always been criticized for testing too small a number. So they want to make up by increasing that And the government has also developed a cluster containment plan where, you know, the entire focus would be on those areas where there is community transmission happening. And the government has also put in place an economic package. Stadia are being converted, 
banquet halls are being converted the ventilators are being procured many of these industries have started to make ventilators and the government of india is also importing large number of equipments i think you know everything putting together we should be able to manage it and what about this 20% of people living in poverty how are they handling this need to wash your hands the need to stay a little bit apart if you live without much to your name and and so close together it's a big challenge bombay for example they have a slum area called the dharavi 10 to 12 people live in small tin hutments so 10 by 10 if people have to spend money to buy water 80 people share one toilet then you know observing all these things becomes difficult and therefore we need to put all our attention there so we are able to increase the testing and isolate those who are positive some staggering numbers there isn't it thanks very much to indian epidemiologist lali kant there While air travel has spread this virus around the globe, there have been differing opinions amongst governments and scientists about the merits of closing down airline routes. Some countries have stopped flights altogether, but many planes are still flying, albeit usually with screening measures at airports. But as Chris has been hearing from Katie Gostick at the University of Chicago, this screening may not actually be effective. This sort of traveler screening historically has not been particularly effective for other pathogens. but we were trying to get a better estimate for how it might play out for this coronavirus. What sorts of screening are and were people doing? The typical screening approach involves a symptom screen, which basically means that your temperature is taken and if you have obvious respiratory difficulties or a cough that would be noted by whoever's doing the screening. And then there's usually also a questionnaire that asks you things about your risk factors. So for example, have you been in an area where we know that there's a coronavirus outbreak? And when you look into this, actually what was your approach? The first thing we did was we asked sort of what's the probability that any single individual passing through screening would be caught. To do that, you basically need to come up with a probability that an infected person is detected in the symptom screen and then another probability that they're detected in the questionnaire based screening we can come up with those probabilities based on what we know about the biology of the virus we basically estimate that people are unlikely to realize they've been exposed to coronavirus based on the fact that a lot of cases were showing up early who weren't able to report a clear source of exposure And then in terms of the probability of having started to show symptoms we can estimate that based on how long the incubation period of the virus is known to be. Do you then take what real world travel data and ask with these assumptions how many would we find? We can test how well it's working by comparing it to real world data. Basically to do that you know at what time different countries had implemented airport screening and like once someone passes through screening and then later end up in the hospital then we know that screening has failed to detect that person right and on the basis of your model and your assumptions how effective is this screening so we estimate that even in sort of the best case scenario that screening is probably missing 50% or more of infected travelers with coronavirus the vast majority of people who would feel well enough to travel probably don't show symptoms at the time that they pass through screening and we know that the incubation period for this pathogen is pretty long and we know that there are some people who are completely asymptomatic and so basically those people who either don't yet show symptoms or might never show clear symptoms are just undetectable gosh 50% that's enormous yes We think that this is one of the big reasons that the virus was able to spread so easily. We are where we are now. We've got a quarter of the world's population in late March currently experiencing some kind of lockdown. What mm-hmm. can we take away from what you found here that obviously it may be a bit late for this situation, but so that we don't get SARS coronavirus mark 3 in the future? I think that's a difficult question. one obvious extreme end of the potential solutions would just be to shut down air travel networks as soon as we detect the next emerging infectious disease that obviously comes with serious economic implications 
But on the other hand, what we've seen here is that it's really difficult to screen for emerging infectious diseases at airports and that air travel is a really important driver of global spread. And so usually the way that public health agencies respond to these scenarios is that as soon as a case is detected, public health professionals try to round up anyone that the first imported case might have been in contact with and infected before those people can start new chains of transmission. People in my field often talk about new epidemics as being like fires and these first imported cases like throwing sparks on the ground. We often can't prevent every spark from coming in, but we can do our best to prevent a big fire from starting. Haiti Gostick, whose research is available in the journal eLife. Hello, sorry to butt in, Katie here from The Naked Scientists. Did you know we make other naked shows too? The fraction of all humanity who has actually gotten a chance to see their own brain is very tiny and you are welcomed to that club. So if you enjoy musing over the mind, reflecting on thought, or frankly feel bamboozled by the brain, check out Naked Neuroscience. Well, my face hurts now, so yeah, let's go, it's spicy. <laughs> Don't go down into the creepy cellar yeah. and turn the light on. <laughs> exactly. Access the full archive via nakedscientist.com slash neuroscience or subscribe to Naked Neuroscience wherever you get your podcasts. On the way, tracking population movement under lockdown and a kitchen science experiment that you can try at home will show you how you can make your very own cloud in a jar. But first, there's a huge effort going on in laboratories all around the world to find a treatment for COVID-19 and a vaccine. And in Vancouver, a team of scientists may have discovered a way to stop the coronavirus infecting cells in the lungs. As he explained to Chris, what Joseph Penninger has done is to produce a decoy version of a chemical called angiotensin converting enzyme 2, and that's the chemical that the virus locks onto to invade our cells. Adding the decoy makes it much harder for the virus to find the real target on a lung cell and trigger the infection in the first place. We tried to find out if a molecule we had engineered, which looks basically like the gate the virus needs to infect us, if blocking the gate could actually be used to block the virus. And this is exactly what happened. Right, so there is a target on cells that the virus wants to infect and it looks for that target and uses that as the doorway. You're saying if we make a fake doorway, we can fool the virus into spending all its time trying to go through a doorway that's broken rather than one that really exists into the cell. Correct, and this is exactly what we tested in our paper. We infected cells with the virus and basically gave them this wrong doorway and by giving the wrong doorway, we could reduce the virus infection by a factor of 1,000 to 5,000 times. What's the doorway? The doorway is a molecule which we call angiotensin converting enzyme number two. The normal function is actually to maintain our blood pressure, to protect our heart, to protect our kidney, to protect our lungs from inflammation processes which are actually damaging our tissues. When the virus binds to this molecule, ACE2, it actually takes it away from the surface of the cell. And this is the reason why we believe uh, SARS and now COVID-19 became such a lethal disease, because it actually hit a molecule which is protecting multiple tissues in our body. So we basically give a molecule and engineer the molecule, which looks like ACE2, but basically free floats around in the body. So it does not allow the virus to get into the cells. And how far have you got with testing this? What have you done so far? What we have shown so far is that in cells grown in a dish, this can indeed block the infection by a factor of 1,000 to 5,000 times. Obviously, you've intervened at what would be an early stage of the infection, but many people don't develop severe disease until they've had it for quite a while. It's almost like it falls into two phases. There's the initial fairly mild phase and then the other effects and the, and the deterioration kick in later. Would it be by then too late for this? You are absolutely right. This is an important consideration. We got now the permission to do a phase two clinical study in COVID-19 patients. And the patients we will treat 
actually patients who have severe disease, so who are already at the later stage of the disease. The reason why we do this is because in these patients, the virus is actually spreading from the lung into other tissues, into the kidney, into the liver, into the heart. And of course, we hope that our drug candidate can catch away the virus so it does not reach these other tissues. The question is, though, why is it that four-fifths of people will bat this away with very, very, very trivial symptoms and only about a fifth of people will develop more severe disease? Everyone's got this angiotensin system running in their body. So why is it that some people end up needing help from molecules like the one you've invented and others don't? Yeah, I, honestly, I have no idea. I think this is one of the critical questions. So why is it that somebody has a hyperactive immune system, which of course drives uh, the disease? And, and I think this will be a very important question to answer. Why is it that older people are mostly affected with severe disease? Uh, we do know that, for instance, uh, younger people have less ACE2, older people have much more ACE2. We do know that smoking, for instance, induces ACE2 in the lung. Diabetes induces ACE2. So basically, in these uh, conditions, there would be more receptor, more doorways available for the virus to infect us. This could partially explain this phenomenon by some people get it worse. But I think there must be other answers, like uh, an aging immune system, for instance. Joseph Penninger speaking to Chris from the University of British Columbia. His paper hasn't yet been peer-reviewed, but it's available online through the journal Cell. Now, while potential treatments are being investigated, people in more than 40 countries around the world are being asked to adapt their lives to a locked-down society. In fact, we think about 25% of the world population is under some kind of lockdown situation. Well, here in the UK, researchers at Oxford University have been using data from mobile phones to understand and predict the impact of the government's social distancing measures on how we move around. So, are we Brits towing the line and staying at home or not? Well, here to explain whether we've been good or not is our Naked Scientist tech commentator and angel investor, Peter Cowley. So, Peter, can you tell me what exactly have these researchers done? Well, we'll explain in a minute what the, the how the technology works, but basically they've come up with some headline figures, some of which are quite astonishing. Apparently, since the beginning of March, the population movement's dropped by 98%. Now, this 98% is based on 100 metres from one's normal place of residence, which, of course, for almost all of us is the home. That seems a large number. 55% of Britain stayed at home on Easter Monday. I'm surprised it's as low as that, actually. I would have yeah, thought it would be more. only half, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I went for a run or, or a cycle or something that day, but uh, not everybody did. As we've heard on the news, overall hospital footfalls has fallen dramatically, and uh, as you've seen, the A&E departments are trying to attract us back in again so we don't uh, have a stroke or, or a heart attack and don't go into hospital. There was a load of data collected and analysed. There's a lot they can do with this, but this was the initial response. 98%. That does seem like... I know we're locked down, but that's still seems high. How have they figured this out? They've figured this out using data from three sources. One of them is so-called Facebook Data for Good. I'm not quite sure what that is, but the other two are are more clear on. There's a company called Cubic, with a Q at the end, that collects data from apps. These are apps that one loads onto one's phone and agrees for the GPS location to be reported back. There's about 500,000 of those. And then something called CK Data, which is slightly more interesting because it's collecting data from mobile phone masts. Not as accurate as a GPS, but it tells you which cell you're in. So a lot of it is apps that you'll have clicked. Yes, location services, that's fine. Not realising that in the terms and conditions it says Um, these can go to, you know, Oxford uh, Research. Yes, you said that, Phil, not me. (laughs) But that's probably correct, exactly. When it comes to that third part, the phone mass data, how does that work? As you move between areas, so on a, in a car, on a train, whatever, you move between mobile phones. So each mobile phone mass knows the location so it can pass it on to the next one. It's within, obviously, it's in some places like, say, the Lake District, it might be covering several kilometres in the centre of London. It might be covering just several tens of metres. But it gives you a reasonably accurate position, certainly in, in a built-up area, where the mobile phone is. So how many people are they covering? They don't, they're not willing to say. They say it's about 500,000 come from the apps. If you look at the ownership of the company, CK Data, it's partially owned by one of the big mobile phone networks in the UK. So I suspect it's many millions of users they have data on. So overall, there seems to be a lot of people. Have they figured out, say that the 55% of people who stayed at home on Easter Monday, how many of those who didn't 
went further afield than their government mandated run or exercise how many um, traveled <laughs> to brighton beach a, or whatnot a, a very good question and I, I can't tell you the answer i think you'd have to interview the the people the academics there i suspect that data will be there and i suspect that data would be something that if we were to have the sort of I wouldn't say please state, but I happen to know somebody in Italy and, and they're, they're finding tens of thousands of citizens a day for non-essential travel, whereas we're just finding hundreds of people a day. So that data could definitely be used in a state that was becoming stronger on enforcing non-essential travel. Thanks very much. Tech correspondent there, Peter Cowley. And finally, beyond the efforts of healthcare staff and other key workers, many other individuals and communities are volunteering their time and resources in the fight against COVID-19. And here in Cambridge, crafters from the MakeSpace Community Workshop have been busy engineering thousands of plastic visors for the local hospital workers at Adambrooks. Katie Hayler spoke to MakeSpace volunteer Julia Citron. One of the engineers who's part of our community works with Adam Brooks Hospital and we got in touch with them to find out what it was that they really needed and that they didn't have yet. The first thing that came to the top of the list was plastic visors. What's the actual production process? It's like a mask, a face shield. It's got a simple foam band around your forehead and then some sort of rigid plastic that goes to just under your chin and it's tied together by some elastic behind your head. It's very simple. The plastic parts are cut on the laser cutter. Somebody cuts the foam strips on the bandsaw and then another person staples the elastic and then there's a very careful quality assurance process to make sure there are no sticking out staples or bits that aren't fastened properly and then a very careful packaging process where we have to put on labels saying that the elastic has latex and things like that. We worked with Adam Brooks to create a document that spells out in a lot of detail exactly how they want them made and packaged and labelled so that they make sure they're safe and, and they're not going to do more harm than good by spreading infection. Our first batch of materials was tricky to get hold of because there's a national plastic shortage at the moment. But one of the volunteers who'd signed up to help works in a factory where they make food packaging. And it just so happened they had a big roll of plastic that they usually use to make transparent cake boxes. That was just the right specification that we needed for these visors. So we got a volunteer to drive over and load it into their car, all 96 kilos of it. And we've been making the plastic from that. How many have you actually made so far? Just yesterday, we made our 5,000th visor. The first thousand masks we made, we gave to Adam Brooks. And then they realised that they actually needed many more than we could make. So they took the document that we'd written together, describing exactly what the visors needed to look like and how they needed to be made. And they've given it to a factory in Sydney, it's, who's now manufacturing 10,000 of these visors a week. So we had 4,000 visors to give away to community organisations and have been overwhelmed with requests from all across Cambridgeshire and the southeast of England. It's a really stressful, anxiety-provoking time for a lot of people at the moment. What is it like to be involved in such a positive, proactive community? It's really nice to not feel completely helpless, to feel like we can do something useful and to feel connected to your local community and to a community of makers at a time like this. A big thank you to all of the volunteers who've been involved sourcing materials and spending their Easter weekend stapling visors in the MakeSpace lab and helping out in lots of big and little ways. An amazing story and uh, thank you very much to Julia Citron from Cambridge Makespace. It's just one of many people who've been doing whatever it is that they can to help out. And now it's time for the mailbox, the part of the show where we read out your correspondence. And listener Ian sent us this coronavirus question. Does extreme temperature incapacitate this virus? Does cooking work? What about a fridge? Say if I were to put it on a cold setting for three days. High temperatures will definitely deactivate coronavirus particles and to be on the safe side that means more than about 60 degrees centigrade, whether that's in the oven, in the dishwasher or when you put fabrics into the washing machine. 
The fridge and extremely low temperatures are a quite different story. We routinely store viruses in very cold temperatures to preserve them for the long term for study and research and so on. And while it's certainly true that freezing and thawing and refreezing viruses will deactivate some particles, many will remain intact and fully infectious. In the fridge, many of the conditions which lead to the natural deactivation of virus particles are not present. It's cool, there's no bright sunlight, and this means the particles remain intact and therefore fully infectious for longer. So high temperatures will deactivate viruses, low temperatures won't necessarily deactivate viruses. Meanwhile, if you have any questions about coronaviruses, do send them in to chris at thenakedscientist.com and we'll be happy to take a look. We've also made a special section of our forum, which you can get to at nakedscientist.com slash covid questions. And there's a whole section there devoted to debate and discussion and answering questions around coronaviruses. We've also made a very special section of our site where all of the different content, podcasts, articles, interviews, And the answers to questions like this one are all in one place. Easy to find, nakedscientist.com forward slash COVID. Plus, you can follow us on social media at Naked Scientists. Leave us a review wherever you get your podcasts. And for half an hour about the mutations that this virus is going through, check out our most recent episode of the Naked Genetics podcast. That's on all podcast platforms. The Naked Scientists podcast is produced in association with Spitfire, cost-effective voice, internet and IP engineering services for UK businesses. Find out how Spitfire can empower your company at spitfire.co.uk. Music in the program is sponsored by Epidemic Sound, perfect music for audio and video productions. This week, we have our eyes firmly locked on the skies. We're going to be learning about bird watching, cloud spotting and stargazing, as well as asking an astronaut how he copes with social isolation. By the end of the show, you'll be able to start a voyage of discovery all from your window. We've also got a kitchen science experiment coming up. We'll show you how to make your own cloud in a jar. If you'd like to do it at home, you'll need the following things. Go get some matches, get a sandwich bag in which you'll want to put some ice cubes, and a jar or just a glass, which you'll need to fill a third full with warm water and just cover that and leave that on the side for now. But before we get to that, we're starting from the sights and sounds of the early morning. Now, even if you live in the city, you're still likely to hear birdsong. And if you're keen-eyed enough, you can spot the culprits who are making those wonderful tunes. Mark Eaton is from the RSPB. He's been a bird watcher for four decades and he's luckily here to guide us through telling apart the dawn chorus. So, Mark, very warm welcome to you. What are you going to do to get us all into bird watching? Well, we're just going to listen to three of the commonest birds we can find in the UK that most people will have around them in their gardens or in their local parks, somewhere they can get to and enjoy bird song. They're three and quite familiar species many people will know already. So the slow step getting into birds. Number one on Mark's list is the blackbird. My favourite bird overall because I love the Latin name, Turdus. (laughs) Let's hear what it sounds like. Now that really is very reminiscent of the dawn chorus. I reckon I've got quite a few of those who are waking me up each morning. What other ways might we recognise a blackbird though? Well, certainly they are that sort of archetypal bird of the dawn chorus. And if you wake up early in the morning, unfortunately, something wakes you up. That's often the first thing, the first bird that starts singing in the morning. So you can hear them on their own before the the others, the sparrows and the pigeons join in. And it's a beautiful song. They like to feed on lawns. So if you've got any grass or park or you've got a lawn in your garden, you'll often see blackbirds bouncing around. They, They hop both feet together and of course the clues in the name not the latin name not the the slightly cheap turdus <laughs> bit but the blackbird they are jet black or the males at least are jet black with a with a yellow beak the females are a bit browner a bit speckledy underneath but you see those males with a sort of orangey yellow beak and a little orange ring around the eye and the long tail they're pretty unmistakable and they're very common so most people will will hear them and, and see them around where they live and do they eat worms when you say they're feeding on the grass and things are they going for worms and grubs and things They are. Yes. Yes. I mean, they are the sort of typical bird, you know, cartoon bird digging for worms. I mean, not many birds actually dig for worms, but blackbirds are one that really do specialise on finding worms in the lawns and in the undergrowth. Let's sort of change it up a little bit, because the next bird on our list is the wren. 
So can we just hear what a wren sounds like? You see, now I'm hearing these sounds, I'm recognising them, and I realise that I've heard loads of these things without ever realising what they are. Tell us about wrens. Wrens are actually our our commonest bird. We have something like 11 million pairs of wrens in the UK, so 22 million of them. They're tiny. I mean, that's why a lot of people won't realise. They might recognise that song. They might not have noticed wrens, despite them being so common, because they, they skulk around, they lurk in bushes, they're brown and streaky, so they're not very obvious, and they're absolutely tiny. They're about... 10 centimetres long, but they're incredibly loud. They have this, this voice you can hear from you know, the length of a playing field away, belting it out. If you see them singing, their whole body vibrates, shakes while they're singing, such is the power they're putting into it, while being nearly our, our smallest bird. It's amazing. So size doesn't really come into it when, when you're a bird. Size and volume don't go hand in hand, or I suppose hand in feather. But um, on to a different yeah. bird now, and that's the starling. Now, these always used to be regarded as a little bit of a sort of a scruffy looking bird. Let's just hear their song for those who might not be so familiar. See, I don't think that's half as tuneful as the prior two that we've listened to. But what can you tell us about starlings, Mark? I'd certainly stand up for starlings. I think they're fascinating birds. I mean, one, you say scruffy, but if you see a starling this time of year, they're black, but they have a beautiful oily sheen, a green and a purple gloss to their feathers, which are dusted with with spots all over on the tips of the feathers. They're beautiful birds. And they make the strangest noises. When they really get singing, it's like a robot trying to imitate a bird, I think. All sorts of strange trills and electronic sounding noises. And they're incredible mimics. They can really copy other birds they hear and other sounds they hear. Where I used to live, I had a neighbour with a very annoying car alarm. Every day his car alarm would go off accidentally. He had some sort of fault. And the starlings learnt the car alarm. So the starlings would sit (laughs) on the aerials and copy the car alarm. So they're remarkable birds, really. You might think they don't look like that much, but they are really clever, fascinating birds. Worryingly, actually, not as common as they used to be. For every five starlings we had when I was young learning to bird watch, there's only one left now. They've really declined. So not all well, but but they are great birds. Mark, thank you very much. And even I feel now a little bit more confident about spotting my birds and, and telling the bird songs apart. It's been great to have you on the programme. Thank you very much. Mark Eaton from the RSPB. Hopefully I'll, I'll remember those three birds and try to recognise them outside. But as the sky brightens now throughout the morning and the dawn chorus starts to die down, we're probably going to get a good view of the clouds. Now, these enormous masses of air and water vapour form for quite specific reasons, and they aren't all built the same. You can even use clouds to do some basic weather forecasting. Mel Strong is a weather expert from the Bradbury Science Museum in Los Alamos, New Mexico, and he ran me through the basics. And get ready, because it's kitchen science time. Today we're going to try to create a cloud in a jar. I want you to find a clear jar or a glass, and preferably it's something that has a lid. Now, the lid doesn't have to be tight-fitting. A piece of paper could serve as a lid for this. You're going to want to fill this jar a quarter to a halfway full of warm water. Go ahead and put whatever lid you have on it and just set it beside. You're also going to need to get a little sandwich baggie full of ice cubes, and you'll need a match. Okay, so I've got my jar, and it's got the warm water in, and I've got my sandwich bag, and I'm putting some ice cubes in it. And I've got my match. What do I do? Okay, so the lid has been on your jar, and as it's been sitting there, there's been water evaporating. And I'm wondering, do you see anything on the sides of the jar right now? Yeah, there's a, there's a bit of condensation. What's happening is we have a lot of water vapor that's inside that jar. And the sides of the jar are relatively cool. And there's water that's condensating onto the sides of the jar. But that's not a cloud. What we're forming here is dew. To get a cloud, we don't want to cool the surface. We want to cool the air. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to explain it first, and I want you to do it kind of all in one motion. Okay. We're going to take the lid off the jar. We're going to light a match. We're going to blow out the match and immediately throw it into the jar. And then we're going to replace the lid with a bag of ice. This is with the warm water in the jar. That's right. Here goes. Okay. 
All right, I've done it. The ice is over it. See if you see anything happening underneath the bag of ice. I do. The air has become cloudy. Yeah, so we are forming a cloud. Now, if you just peel the bag of ice back a little bit, the cloud might come out. It's not coming out as a big puffy cloud, but it's coming out as cloudy vapor. So we have cooled the air with ice. In nature, generally what happens is air is cooled because it is lifted upwards into the atmosphere. When water condensates, it needs a surface to condensate onto. In nature, those surfaces are little tiny microscopic pieces of dust and salt, condensation nuclei. We added condensation nuclei with our match that added some smoke. When we put the ice over the top of the jar, we then cooled the air inside the jar such that condensation would occur on those little tiny smoke particles that we added. Oh, so just like the water was condensing on the cool sides of the glass before, now it was condensing in the cool air, but on the little bits of smoke that came from the match. That's right. And that's really how clouds form. That's really how clouds form. Okay, if that's how clouds are made, how come you get different kinds of clouds? Right. Almost all clouds are formed by air rising. And there's really two ways that air can rise. There's a whole class of clouds that we call cumuliform clouds. And these are the puffy, sort of cotton-looking clouds. When you see one of these, you know that air is rising because you have little pockets of air that are warmer than the air around it. The other type of clouds are more like blankets. We call these stratiform clouds. And in this case, what's happening is the entire air above our heads, the entire sky you see, is being uplifted slowly. They're pretty boring to look at. It makes a gray <laughs> sky. Okay, I've got all this new uh, cloud knowledge. Is there anything I can do with this? Can I start to predict weather patterns? There is actually a somewhat predictable series of clouds that you can get that we often refer to as a winter storm. You're going to start out with these high, streaky ice clouds. So the sky's going to look streaky. And then you're going to notice that there's a ring around the sun. Maybe another half day later, the sun is a fuzzy ball. Perhaps a half day after that, the sun is not visible. Then we have rain. And the rain will last maybe 24 hours or so. During this segment, what's happening is the warm pool of air is passing over our heads. This is called the warm front. Perhaps the next day, you'll notice that the temperatures plummet and the sky seems to sort of break up and the rain seems to have stopped. But what you'll notice is the types of clouds have changed to these little individual puffy clouds. And usually in a well-developed storm, these will turn into tall, towering, puffy clouds that we call cumulonimbus. And you'll see pockets of rain. Generally, we call this portion of the storm scattered showers. And this will happen for perhaps another couple of days. And then finally, you'll be in this pool of relatively cold, dry air. So back to your question about weather prediction with clouds. If you see those initial steps, the ring around the sun, the fuzzy sun, you can pretty much bet that it's probably going to be raining in about 24 hours or so. Okay, I can predict the weather. Yes, you can. And you can imagine that if you were a farmer back several hundred years ago, this is how you would predict the weather. Mel Strong there from Los Alamos in the USA. This week, we're gazing up at the vault of the heavens and revealing some of its mysteries. We've talked about the sky during the day. Now it's time for the sky at night. And here to teach us the basics of some stargazing is Robert Massey. He's from the Royal Astronomical Society. Hello, Robert. Welcome to the programme. Hi. Tell me, if I want to get into some basic stargazing, because the closest I've come is just laying out in the Australian outback and not being able to go to sleep all night because the starscape was just so amazing and just watching it all night... What would I do if I wanted to be a bit more professional about my endeavours? 
actually going to the Australian outbreak and looking up at the scars is the stuff of dreams in many, many ways for many people looking at it. But I think the best thing to do is to start to learn the constellations and the names of some of the stars above our head, be able to spot, you know, the brightest planets in the sky. And also if you have access to something like a, a small pair of binoculars, that's a really nice addition too. It's important to realize you don't need to spend a great deal of money on expensive kit. I mean, obviously that's very, very easy to do, but I think there's simply no point in doing that. The best thing to do is actually get a feel for the sky to begin with. I'm glad you brought that up because that was sort of foremost in my mind. How do I know what I'm actually looking at? Because when I look at maps of the sky and then I look up at the sky, it's quite hard to make that mental translation between what I see in a book and then what these bright pinpoints of light are. How do you do that? You're quite right because you look at a map in a book and it may be that that's a map showing you many more stars than you can see. If you're exceptionally lucky, you might be in a place where you see more stars than the book shows and that could confuse the shapes as well. But the best thing to do is to start to recognise the patterns. Now there are some really nice signposts. For example, in the spring sky as we are now, pretty much after sunset you see the plough or the big dipper in North America swinging overhead to those seven stars with that kind of saucepan shape. You can use the curve of the handle of the saucepan, track it down, and you come to a really bright star called Arcturus. And these kind of things are the way that you find your way around the sky. It's interesting that you, you sort of mentioned a star there, because, of course, when we look heavenward, we're going to see stars, we're going to see planets, and then we might even see small satellites that we've made and put up in space. So how do we tell them all apart? That's a really, really good question. I mean, something like Arcturus, sure look, it's a bright star, and sometimes people think, oh, maybe that's a plane or something. And the answer is generally that stars tend to twinkle. And the reason they do that is that they're very far away, so they're effectively point sources of light. The light gets to us, it travels pretty much unfettered all the way through the cosmos, arrives at the Earth's atmosphere, and then the shifting air currents move that light around, and we see a twinkling effect. Now, with a planet, although... Planets are generally much smaller than stars. They're much, much closer, the ones we can see. They tend to look quite bright as well, which is another giveaway, but it has a steady light too. If you see something like Venus in the evening sky, as you can right now, actually, you'll see it's not only bright, but it's steady too, and that's a great big giveaway. And something like a satellite, which kind of varies in brightness and, and so on, but actually, again, they don't tend to twinkle all the... They, move uh, very, very obviously as well. It only takes a couple of minutes typically for a satellite to go from one side of the sky to the other. Venus is incredibly bright, isn't it? Even I know where Venus is and it stands out for being so bright. Mars, very, very red. Is that some other reason that they look bright because they're close to the sun and red because they're made of red stuff? Or is that a myth? No, I mean, the colour of Mars, for example, Mars, if you want to see Mars, actually, it's visible in the dawn sky just before the sunrise at the moment. And in the case of Mars, it is genuinely red, as if you ever look at the pictures from the rovers that have driven around its surface, that's really, really obvious. It's covered with this rusty stuff. Something like Venus generally has a whitish colour because it has a thick carbon dioxide atmosphere and it reflects a lot of light, so it's genuinely bright. But planets, unlike stars, are shining due to reflected sunlight and Something like Venus is close to the Earth. It's uh, closer to the Earth than the Sun is at the moment. And because it's close and it's about the size of the Earth, then we're seeing it well because it reflects a lot of light and that light you know, doesn't have that far to travel compared with a star. So it appears really, really bright in the sky. In fact, it's actually so bright that if you're in the right set of circumstances and you can try this, but I would only suggest that you make sure the Sun is hidden behind a building, you can actually see Venus during the day. I've done that quite a few times if the sky is very, very clear. And just to finish, Robert, can we just bring up one thing which really does deserve recognition? Because this week, a very important birthday is going to be celebrated. 30 years since the Hubble Space Telescope was launched. And it's really been something that's been present throughout my growing up and has revolutionised, arguably, our understanding of the heavens and our view of the skies. I just wondered if you had any thoughts on that too. Absolutely extraordinary success. The remarkable thing is when it was launched back in 1990... It didn't work that well because the mirror was slightly the wrong shape, so they had to fly a correction mission up a couple of years later, and then all of that was forgotten because ever since that time it's been a phenomenal success. It sent back images of planets in our own solar system, of distant galaxies. Actually, it's helped find uh, planets around other stars and forming solar systems around other stars, and it also helped us understand the age of the universe, so it's been an extraordinary success. Thank you very much. There's Robert Massey from the Royal Astronomical Society. Finally, after gazing up at the darkness of space, let's hear from someone who's actually been there. 
Steve Swanson is a former NASA astronaut who, during his career, helped build the International Space Station, and he's a former ISS commander. I asked him about his tips for dealing with isolation, as well as what the view's like from so high up. When I first spacewalked, I went out the hatch and I worked my way out to my work site, which happens to be on the very end of the station, the last handrail on that side of the station. I set myself up, getting ready to work, started working, all this, and then the sun comes out and I get to see the earth way down below me, you know, the space station off to the side. I gripped my handrail so tight, I didn't move for a minute because it was like this idea that you're way above earth with nothing below you and you should be falling down and this is not a safe place to be. It's not on the conscious level kind of, of like, I can control this, I can figure it out. There's some sort of innate kind of fear thing and you don't really have much control of it for a minute until you kind of can calm yourself back down. That view that you get, how does the view you get of the night sky from the ground compare to what you get when you're up there in space? The biggest difference is there is not an atmosphere to look through, so there's no twinkling of the stars or all these pinpoints of light. It was not so easy to stargaze on the space station. We don't really have a window that goes up. If you want to look at the stars, which we got to a couple of times because we maybe moved the attitude of the station a little bit, we had to make this area really, really dark. Uh, it's like trying to see the stars from inside your house. If there's any lights on at all, it's going to ruin it. You can't really see anything. So we would, uh, I made a, I said, a blanket with Velcro on the edges that I could put around this whole area and really make it dark. And then we could watch the stars. I don't know about you. Are you in lockdown like so many of us across the world? Yes, we're in a stay-at-home policy here in Idaho. How does that compare to being up there in space with maybe just a couple of other people? Is there similar isolation or is it very different? Yeah, I guess similar in a way. It's quite a bit easier right now, at least where I am, because I can go out and go for walks or runs or go to the grocery store. I can still do all those things. I just have to be careful about what I do when I do that. On the space station, I mean, you just can't go outside, right? And so you're stuck inside for almost six months. Have you got any tips then for how to keep, you know, healthy and emotionally okay and generally well? Yeah, so I, I mean, it's, everybody's going to be different. So that's, I'll just say what works for me. And maybe people can take this and adapt it for what works for them. First thing was stay busy. And that wasn't really a choice on the space station. It was a very busy schedule. It was like a 12-hour workday. So I didn't really think about, oh, I'm, you know, I'm isolated. I can't go back home. I can't do these things. I was enjoying my time up there and I was busy. Next thing is stay in communication with your friends and family. And the last thing I like to say is you definitely uh, have some fun too. Because it's now if you're stuck in your house, you're not going to be doing the same thing you would normally do. And we did that on the space station. We came up with new games to play in this floating environment. And uh, it helped relieve all our kind of stress and tension. Like what sort of games? Oh, man. <laughs> well, we had uh, Nerf dart guns, so we would come up with a game of uh, we could do duels. Uh, we found we did, a, we, did a, we did a full on, you know, Nerf dart gun war. And the first time we brought out the Nerf dart guns and it was only nine bullets out of all this. And it took us an hour and a half to find them. So we decided not to do that again. So we came up with everybody gets one bullet and we'll just do duels and stuff like that. Competitions to see who could do the most flips. It was basically what we had our fun day was Sunday. We played all sorts of games. Former International Space Station Commander Steve Swanson. And thanks to our other guests on this program, Mark Eaton, Mel Strong and Robert Massey. And we've just got time for Question of the Week and Adam Murphy is delivering this question from Pavel. On one of the Naked Scientist programs, it was mentioned that a newborn baby has initially sterile intestines and gets most of its microbiome during the passage through uterus and vagina. What happens to children brought to this world via a caesarean? The microbiome is a collection of bacteria that exist in and on you. It's an ecosystem in its own right, and issues with a person's microbiome have been linked to a litany of diseases. So it's important, if we can, to put the best foot forward. So what happens to the microbiome during a caesarean section? We reached out to Peter Brocklehurst from the University of Birmingham for an answer. It depends on whether the waters around the baby are intact or broken at the time of the caesarean section. If the caesarean section is done after the waters around the baby are broken, whether this is in labour or before labour starts, then bacteria from the mother's vagina can reach the baby and be present in the baby's gut at the time of the caesarean section. 
we believe that the longer the waters are broken, the more likely the varieties of bacteria in these babies will resemble those of a baby born vaginally. When the mother's water breaks, the fluid-filled sac in the womb, called the amniotic sac, ruptures, and that usually happens at the start of labour, but not always with a caesarean section. Babies born by caesarean section with the waters intact, which is more than half of all births by caesarean, pick up bacteria from the environment. This can include the mother's skin, the midwife's hands, any instruments used after the birth, such as oxygen masks if the baby needs help breathing, and other hospital surfaces that the baby or anyone handling the baby may come into contact with. Our research showed that babies born by caesarean section with intact waters were much more likely to have bacteria in their guts which are found in hospitals, and some of these potentially harmful bacteria were resistant to antibiotics. Sometimes a caesarean section is a medical necessity, but there are many reasons a mother may choose to have one, both medical and personal. But given our continually growing understanding of the importance of the microbiome, it's worth understanding what happens at all stages of life. We don't yet know what this means for babies in the long term. Once babies start feeding and being exposed to all sorts of other bacteria as they get older, the types of bacteria babies have in their guts changes and becomes more similar. But even after six months, we still found more potentially harmful antibiotic-resistant bacteria in the guts of babies born by caesarean section. Thank you, Peter, for doing the labour in bringing us that answer. Next week, we're looking into this question, which has been getting on Matt's nerves. Do all humans have the same number of nerve endings on their skin? And if so, do those of us who are bigger, either taller or fatter, have the same sensitivity of a given area of skin reduced? Well, there's one to scratch your head about and probably stimulate some nerve cells into the bark. And if you think you know the answer, why not drop us a line? It's chris at thenakedscientist.com. You can also tweet at Naked Scientist. We've got our forum, nakedscientist.com forward slash forum. And if you have a question you'd like to submit to us for consideration in Question of the Week, nakedscientist.com slash question takes you to a very easy to fill in form. That is it for this week. Thank you very much to Phil who put the whole programme together. And do join us at the same time next week when we're going to be exploring the wider impacts of the coronavirus pandemic. Everything from the economics to the politics and to the mental health issues. We're going to be exploring the ripple effects of coronavirus that go well beyond the emergency room. The Naked Scientist comes to you from Cambridge University and it's supported by Rolls-Royce. Thanks for listening. Until next time, from me, Chris Smith, and the rest of the Naked Scientist team, goodbye. Goodbye.